There's a term we use in Australia called, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. SQL tuning best practice. Here's the question that came in. I'm a DBA and the developers throw all sorts of complicated SQLs my way to tune them. There's so much information about tuning. Can you give me a simple process to follow? Before I go to my process, one thing I would encourage is a lot of shops still have this DBA developer separation. And often it's not just a cultural thing. Often it's DBA sit in a different room, different office, different country, different continent, which I always find tragic. But nowadays with Zoom, Teams, Slack, etc., I would hope that the, the most successful project teams I've ever worked on, whether it's virtually or physically, DBAs and developers sit together. And that's one of the things that I find really problematic in the world of, of siloed technology skills nowadays. So I do think it's important that the closer the collaboration, the better. So environments where developers do write applications and throw them over the fence to DBAs are almost always going to be destined to fail. It's much better if DBAs, and I'm not talking about the, from the sort of traditional DBA role, I'm talking about any person who has database specialist expertise, the closer you can sit them in with the developers, the more successful you're likely to be. Similarly, I worked at a place before I joined Oracle where literally the DBAs, including myself and the developers and even the testers sat literally in the same cubicle blocks. And that way, when the developers had their, some code run, they'd run their unit tests for system tests, they'd literally lean over and speak to the tester. Or if the system test didn't work, the tester would simply lean back and say, hey, Bob, your code's junk. And that kind of close collaboration made for a very successful application. Uh, that project I left in 2014, it went live in 2010, and I know for a fact that it's still running pretty much unchanged today, 12 years later. Anyway, this is Connor's three-step guide, the three-step guide to tuning SQL. All you need is three steps. Step one is forget about the SQL. We're so focused often on the tech and the SQL sometimes that we forget stepping back and saying, SQL is designed to achieve a business process. And often a lot of SQL tuning is simply asking what question is trying to be achieved because sometimes it's not a case of tuning the SQL, it's a case of either throwing away the SQL altogether because you can get that data from perhaps a different source, e.g. a materialized view or maybe even a different database like a data warehouse instead of the live system. Or sometimes it's just explaining to the person that requested the SQL, not necessarily the developer, maybe the business person behind it, what the implications are. I've had a number of times where you know, a requirement will come in saying, yep, we need to see total budget forecasts for the last decade and we need it sub-second. And it's only when you go explain to that business person that, oh, 10 years worth of data is 500 billion rows. If we want to achieve that sub-second, we're going to have to do some significant architectural and design changes. And often it's not a question of the business person going, oh, well, let's do that. It's like, oh, I never thought we'd have to scan 500 billion rows we'll come up with some other, we don't need that requirement that desperately. So step one is always step back from the SQL, focus on the business function, and then adopt, you know, tackle that first. Sometimes it means not running the SQL. Sometimes it means a different SQL. Sometimes it means, yes, we actually have to go ahead and take this existing SQL with the existing data structures and see why it's running slowly. But at least we've now got a point in the sand where we know we actually have to tackle the SQL in its entirety. Rule number two for me is all that matters is cardinality. And for the database optimizer, cardinality is everything. Now, this might sound like some sort of profound technological statement, but it's not. It's the same with any kind of process optimization, even humans. If you go to the shop, or if I go to the shop, I grab a basket when I walk in. In fact, nowadays I grab a basket, then I'll scan the barcode with my COVID app and then I'll put my mask on and I'll you know, <laughs> go through all that rigmarole. But ultimately I grab a basket, grab a few things. When I'm ready to leave, do I just walk to any old checkout line? Of course not. I optimize. I look along the line and I say, okay, what's the best line? And I might say, bang, down there at lane five. Lane five, there's just one person there. I can't see the trolley, but they look like they're almost done. I sprint down to there and what happens when I get there? The guy in front of me or the woman in front of me, it doesn't matter, they've got the trolley from hell. This is an optimization fail. My optimizer estimate was lane five's the best. 
the reality was this nightmare scenario where it obviously wasn't the best. So let's talk about that with some real data. Many moons ago, I worked at the Western Australian Police Force, and therefore we dealt with all the vehicles in Western Australia. They're all registered through the police, etc. Here's a bit of realish data. And I say realish because it was at least over a decade ago, but effectively I've got some rough numbers which represent Western Australian drivers. We've got about 4.7 million registered vehicles in Western Australia. Makes sense, there's about two and a half million people in WA. I'm doing all the good things. I'm gathering all the stats we need. I'm putting full histograms on all the columns, etc. If I go ask the optimizer, how many vehicles out of the 4.7 million are Toyotas? There's about 600,000. In reality, there's 600,000 Toyotas in Western Australia. The optimizer thought there would be about 600,000, 590,000. This is a good optimizer decision. It's probably correct that I should use the index range scan for this because my estimate of reality was pretty close to reality. It's the same with the shopping cart metaphor. If I found a good lane, I'd be happy. I've optimized the process. What if I look at make and model? I'm looking now for Toyota Hiluxes. And it turns out that there are, out of the 600,000 Toyotas in Western Australia, nearly half of them are Toyota Hiluxes. Now, the database thought only 300 would be Hiluxes because there's lots of different Toyotas. There's Corollas and Hiluxes and Camrys and Pajero, this Pajero, Pajero's might be Nissan, not sure, but lots of different Toyotas around the world. It turns out that in Western Australia, people love their Hiluxes. I have no idea why, because a Hilux, if you don't know, is a commercial vehicle. It's like a utility, you know, it's like it's got a cab at the back. The key thing here is as just like the shopping center, it's the actual situation versus your estimate. I estimated there would be 300 Hiluxes. There was actually 280,000 of them. That differential is a problem because when the optimizer gets the estimate wrong, therefore the cardinality is wrong, that's when you have plans that go terribly wrong. And there's one fantastic hint that reveals all this information to you. And this is my part two of tuning SQL. If I can, I run the SQL, it's a problem in SQL with the gather plan statistics hint. You run the query, it says, here's your actual 257,000 cars were actually Toyota Hiluxes. And then I run display cursor with all stats last. Show me the optimizer statistics from the last execution of that query. And rather than seeing the normal execution plan, we get these two special columns. E rows, the estimated rows, and A rows, the actual rows. This is gold when it comes to performance tuning because all you need to look at is where are the discrepancies? If those two numbers align roughly, like same order of magnitude, there's a very good chance the optimizer got the numbers right, which means there's a very good chance the optimizer got the plan correct. If the numbers are way out, in this case, we can see, we thought there'd be 300 Toyota Hiluxes, there was actually 257,000 of them, we can draw questions. Maybe this index was not a good option to use because this estimate versus actuals was so far out. So this is my step two. Once you've identified any cardinality issues, it really helps then focusing on the next step. Now, rule three <laughs> is where you're gonna hate me. Rule three is you then work from there because the reality is it's the cardinality estimates that drive what you do next. For example, why were my cardinal estimates wrong? Maybe the stats were wrong. Maybe the stats were old. So maybe I need to regather stats. We saw that the stats were fine. I gathered stats after populating the table, but maybe I'm missing some histograms. Maybe the histograms would actually solve that issue. In this case, we had histograms on there, so it's not that. Maybe we needed extended stats. This would have fixed this particular problem. There was a correlation between the make, Toyota, and the model, the Hilux. There's not an even distribution of models amongst the make. We needed to have the correlation between those two columns to actually get better statistics. Extended stats would have fixed this issue. It could just be poor SQL. It doesn't matter if I've got good stats on the make and the model, if someone's doing a query where the upper of the model or the lower of the make or substring of the model contains something. We might then need to do different kind of stats, stats on the column expressions. But the key thing is we saw where the cardinalities went wrong, and then we start working from that with the SQL query to decide what's our plan of attack. Don't forget, some queries are impossible to optimize. 
If you've got a query with 37 predicates and each one has different expressions and some have a case statement around them, etc., there is no set of statistics available ever that will give the optimizer enough information to come up with a perfect plan. It's going to make all sorts of assumptions and guesses. If it's impossible to optimize based on pre-calculated stats, we have rule three alternate version. One of the things I love doing is if you have a query that's really hard to tune, crank up the dynamic sampling to 11, crank it way, way up, which simply tells the database, look, go ahead and run this query and do all sorts of scans on the candidate tables inside here to come up with real data that matches all those incredible list of complicated predicates you've supplied, including the joins, et cetera. So effectively, you're running your query almost slightly once, to come up with the, the, the real data, how many rows will match this complicated set of predicates. Because of that, because I now have real stats on how this query rows will return, I'll generally come up with a really good plan or the best possible plan that the optimizer is going to be capable of doing. Now that I've spent that time, spent that effort using dynamic sampling, that's going to cost you in terms of resource, but I've very good poss possibility of getting a great plan out of it. Use SPM, lock that plan in, and the job is done. You've paid that price once with a huge dynamic sampling, but now you've got the good plan, use SPM, and that plan is going to hold on for at least until the next you know, major change of database uh, data to your database system. Be aware, as I said, there's a term we use in Australia called, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. All these things generally are bound to good database design principles. If you've got one of those systems where the most important piece of data is in characters 3, 7, and 13 tucked away in some column, and that column is stored in a JSON structure, and that JSON structure is stored in a binary Java serialized object, and you've stuck that into a blob, well, good luck. You know, if you've got a bad database design, then you're always going to be up against it. So be aware that the optimizer can only work with what it's presented. It does its best. I'm always amazed at how good the optimizer does, but the reality is a catastrophic database design is going to have you up against it all the time. And at some point in time, you might have to actually augment, adjust, change the design just to give the optimizer an even chance at coming up with good optimizer plans because there are some sequels that just are never going to run well because they're being hamstrung by a terrible database design.